Welcome to the Helper Be Brave podcast show where you get great ideas on how you can help save lives. And I'm Amy Ford with Embrace Grace. And I'm Jessica Russo with Embrace Grace. And we're so excited today that um, we have Destiny and she is a part of the pro-life movement. We, we're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area where we're based. So she's here in Dallas. So I get to spend a lot more time with her than a lot of other um, organizations. And the more time you spend with her, the more you love her, the more you love her. She, she's one of a kind. <laughs> and she, if you follow her on any of the social media pages, you may be shocked, um, laugh hysterically. Um, she's not for the faint of heart, but the work that she's doing is so inspiring. Yes. Like the, and, and we she's love. She's a warrior. She is a warrior and she's not afraid to have hard conversations. Mm-hmm. And she, and, and she's such a great advocate and has great ways of how she uh, puts a pro-life language into a different way so that pro-choice people might would listen more Mm -hmm. but then she also is not just an advocate she also is boots on the ground and what she's doing at the border is just totally amazing of how she's helping women and whereas so we're so excited to have her on today destiny are you there hey amy I'm super pumped about you being here today and I just feel like you offer a unique perspective to everyone about even just how we talk about life. And I want to hear a little bit about your story. But um, before that, you know, we've said at the beginning, you are with, you are the president of New Wave Feminists. And a lot of times with ultra conservative people, they kind of freak out about that word feminism. Um, So what do you think is your perspective of what is a feminist? Yeah, I mean, I, I, pull it back to the basics, just Webster dictionary definition of feminism is that men and women should have the same equal opportunities and rights. And I think everybody kind of agrees with that. I think the reason that hyper-conservative people, um, even even moderately conservative people, are standoffish about that word is because it has really been co-opted by um, radically pro-choice, pro-abortion feminists. And so the funny thing is they'll they'll be mad that not everybody's a feminist. Everybody should be a feminist. But at the same time, the second you tell them you're pro-life, they tell you you're not a feminist. And so it's kind of like this club that they they choose who can be in it based on the abortion issue. It's become synonymous with abortion. And we just refuse to accept that. Um, and so we are pro-life feminists. And that usually makes people's heads explode because it seems um, like a complete oxymoron. But actually, it makes the most sense because if we believe that we were fighting against patriarchal constructs that viewed women as property, then why would it be okay that through our rights and liberation, now we're treating another subset of the human population, the unborn child, as property? So for us, it's completely consistent to be pro-life, to be feminist. Feminism is about using your liberation and your privilege and your strength to stand up for the marginalized. And there's no group more marginalized than the unborn child. Right. And like, we like men like a lot. <laughs> we like men a lot. And we, you know, all of, uh, Jessica has four sons. I have two. You have two. Um, you know, I, have two. I, I like them so much. I build them with my body. I, have <laughs> I make, I make more men. We so. made more men. Right. We love them and we love their strengths and their gifts and yeah. how God made them. And I'm still, I, I love to say that I'm a feminist, but I also want them to get the bug and change the oil if possible. (laughs) I don't want to do that stuff. Um, So maybe it's, you know, I love your bad feminist shirt that you wear all the time. That's, that is um, maybe accurate to other people, but I love that because like feminism is you can have your baby in your dreams too. Like you are a strong woman. And especially I believe with God that when we lean on him with our weaknesses, that he is the strength that we need. And so um, I love how you are changing the narrative about what feminism is to back to a consistent um, line of thinking. So like what made you even or what inspired you to really even get involved in the pro-life movement and um, like what makes you passionate about it? So I think that it's probably just um, my own personal story. My mom got pregnant with me when she was 19 years old at the University of Texas in Austin. And um, she was raised in a fairly religious household. My grandparents are ordained ministers. And so 
she had to actually go back home and let them know, um, not only am I not a virgin, but um, I'm single now and I'm pregnant. And the the way that they just received her back and loved her anyway. And I think they were sad for her because they knew that her life was going to take a different path now. You know, um, things are going to be much more difficult. And, but at the same time, they instilled in her, this is a human being, this is a human life, and it is a blessing. This child is a blessing. And so she had that support from her family. And I realized how easily I could have been aborted. Um, you know, I think that a lot of people in her life probably would have thought that would have been the responsible thing so she could continue her education. And I think this is kind of also, people ask all the time, when did I become pro-life and when did I become a feminist? I've always been both. Because when I look at that scenario and I realize kind of how difficult our life was after I was born, she had a couple of failed marriages. We experienced poverty and, you know, she was in abusive relationships and all of these reasons that are given for why women need abortion. Um, it really frustrates me because if you go back to the moment when she found out she was pregnant and it became this choice of, do I finish school or do I have my child? I'm not okay as a feminist with the fact that that's the choice she had to make. I think you should be able to have your child and finish school. I think that a truly feminist world is one that honors and respects our fertility and makes it possible for women to have children and finish their education and we have the infrastructure to support that right like that in my mind is what feminists should be fighting for not just um access to abortion so that we can kind of fit into this male normative world but a world that fully accepts who we are as women and and makes it work for us and for our children right and so i think um that obviously kind of is is the story behind my belief and why I'm passionate about it. But then I myself became pregnant at 16. And that's when it went from a, you know, like a head knowledge to heart knowledge and really having to say, okay, do, do I truly believe this? Am I going to live it out? And with my son, um, again, thankfully I had family support like my mom did. I wasn't kicked out uh, of my house. I had health insurance. I had these basic needs met. So I was able to continue my pregnancy, but I also know that so many of my peers who were choosing abortion at the time, friends that I was going to high school with, um, for so many of them, it was not a choice. And that's what always kind of irks me about it being called like the pro-choice side. Like I was watching as their families were forcing them to have abortions. I was watching as they were having to make this decision because of financial constraints or, you know, a lack of access to other resources. And so to me, I'm the one who, who truly kind of had a lot of options. Um, I considered adoption for the first two trimesters. Ultimately, I ended up deciding that I was going to parent. And um, my son's 19 now, which is so wild to me. Uh, like, he's a grown adult. He's, he's a grown adult. It's just, it's still mind-blowing. I know you have a similar experience. Yeah, it's weird to have like a man-child. He's like a <laughs> child. He's my child. He's my baby, but he's, he's a man. He's a man. So yeah, amazing. it's super strange, but it's also really cool. And it's funny because I remember, um, like, I, I got pregnant with him at 16, had him when I was 17. And so when he turned 17, he said to me, he, like, kind of joked and said, hey, look, I did better than you did. I, I haven't had a kid yet. Oh and I was like, do you see the amazing kid that I'm looking at right now? Like, I actually don't think you can beat what I did. Yeah, <laughs> right. Amazing. Oh, that's so Like, sweet. you did the good work, girl. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Oh my goodness. Well, you know, I have an unplanned story. When I was 16, I found myself in an unplanned pregnancy, um, kind of grew up in a more religious home and I didn't understand that relationship with God. So it was like that pass or fail feeling for me. And we were just talking about this yesterday, Amy, um, offset, but when I went for my, you know, quote counseling session at the abortion clinic, um, I remember, you know, I don't remember a lot about that day, but I remember the woman asking me, phrasing her words very carefully, and she said, um, why are you making this choice today? And, I, you know, I spat off all the things and the fear, and my, I'm going to disappoint my family and all this, you know, 16 years old. And she said in response to me, you're making the right choice. You're saving your family a lot of trouble. And, you know, this was another woman and this was supposed to be somewhere that was, you know, quote, helping me. Yeah, and you're so, only 16. And I'm 16, right? So, like, our society tells women that our pregnancies, our fertility is an inconvenience to our world. It's a trouble. It's something to 
have to deal with, not something that we get to celebrate. And like that stuck with me for a long time, feeling like my womanness made me broken or something. Yeah, that's absolutely. I think the message that we send is that our fertility is is truly a liability to the world around us, right? Like yeah. whether it's in academia or the workforce, rather than realizing the power of women in motherhood and just our talents and our natural abilities, you know, I mean, they've done study after study that companies that actually accommodate women and have things like maternity leave have a higher success rate just overall. And so we know that this system works, that when we support women, um, it's a positive thing for everybody. It elevates everybody, men, women, companies, you know, corporate, academia, everything. But yet we still, I think, especially as women really do feel um, that message that there's shame tied to it that you've embarrassed somebody. And I think that's also the hard thing because as a female, you're the one who it's very obvious that you're in an unplanned pregnancy, right? Like yeah. the men don't necessarily get that side of things. And so it's almost like we have to be twice as strong in the face of that and twice as brave. And you just, I, I remember walking through the halls of my high school and people whispering and gossiping about me. And at the time my boyfriend had actually transferred school. He, he didn't even go and he, broken up with me by the time I had children. Um, <clears throat> transferred school. So he didn't have to deal with any of that. I had to deal with all of it. And I remember this one turning point where it was just like, you know what? I do this. Like, I'm not going to let them shame me about this. This is badass. I could have easily gone and, you know, slept this under the rug and, and nobody could have known about it. Like, I'm making the hard choice right now. And I don't care if you don't like it, but I refuse to kind of take on that shame. Leanne, it's hard when you're 16 and yeah. you're, you know, the the gossip is focused completely on you for your entire high school. Like, it's definitely tough. As if being a teenager isn't hard enough. Right. Right. I know. So what are, I love like some of the signs and stuff that you have when you go to like March for Life and um, different, you know, opportunities to get your message out. And I'm always, I just love the wording that you use because it's such a spin on the wording that um, pro-choice people use, but it's, it's, uh, to me, it just like so resonates with me. And I think that it helps we, um, the younger generation too, like we had my son Jess on and he was talking about how um, that he feels like there is hope with this next generation because they're so all about helping people and helping the marginalized. And so if we can just change the narrative a little bit about like that, the, the, the unborn is marginalized and the, and that if we can change it a bit and really get that out there, which I really feel like that is what you're doing. Me and Jess always talk about how you're so smart that we love like the way you um, have your messaging, but what are like some of the signs and things that you've used at these pro-life um, or pro-choice, I mean, you went to the Women's March and even though you like, famously got kicked, got kicked out, out. Right. <laughs> got kicked out um, because you're we not woman enough. Out, but, but you still you went, know, girl. I, we still went. Like, yeah, you can try to kick us out. Good luck with that. Um, <laughs> Maybe they no, can just so check have, to make sure you're actually. If it's a women's march, let's let's check to make sure you're really a woman. Well, I mean, and I, I go out of my way to have purple hair, so I made it pretty easy to spot me. And the crazy thing is we actually had a really great experience there. Like, we had a number of women stop by and say, I think it was wrong that they kicked you out of this. So totally. the the women actually involved are totally fine with embracing us because we do overlap and we agree on so much. Um, and so for that one, we took our signs to say, I'm a pro-life feminist, which, again, it's like when people see that, it takes them a second, and it's a great conversation starter. But we also have ones that say, you know, our liberation can't be bought with the blood of our children. And I think that this kind of gets back to the roots of the feminist message, that this is something where we are sick of um, compromising. We're sick of being treated like property. And so we're certainly not going to pass that oppression down to our children. Uh, and that's, that's ultimately what we would be doing. If we're trying to smash the patriarchy, we can't become the patriarchy. We can't objectify other human beings in the process in order to um, get to this place of liberation. Like, being a feminist is about using our strength and liberation um, to, to help the less fortunate. And when you look around society in every other instance, uh, whether it comes to, you know, mental health or addiction or homelessness, like usually when we see people in this state of vulnerability, our response is we need to get them resources. We need to help them. 
But for some reason, when it comes to the vulnerability of the unborn human being in the womb, it's we need to erase them, right? Like out of sight, out of mind. As long as, as we don't have to know exactly what's going on, like it would just be more convenient for everybody if you got rid of them. And so, you know, this is a fight where we truly are trying to be a voice for the absolutely voiceless and show the humanity of the unborn person. And I think for us, a big part of that is humanizing the unborn, humanizing ourselves, and humanizing people on the other side. You know, we we don't go out there, you know, guns blazing or whatever. I don't know. I'm from Texas. We say that too much. We don't actually <laughs> mean real guns. But, um, you know, we don't go out there and get up in people's faces and are super aggressive. It's more, um, you know, help me understand your own inconsistency here because you care about animals and, you know, um, kids in foster care and all these things. Like, we care about all that, too. So, like, how, why, why don't you extend that into the womb when human beings are at their weakest and most vulnerable? And, and I, wondered because, if, I wondered if we should, you know, the commercial with the SBCA where they have, who is it? The Sarah, Sarah McLaughlin. Yes. <laughs> then we could have like, you know, little sonogram pictures <laughs> with the we song do it. Can, and like, maybe that'll be it. <laughs> you should sing a little bit of that song no, no, no. right now for the podcast today. <laughs> no, right no, now. Thanks. Let's right now. do it. It might work. <laughs> I'd be a marketing <laughs> strategy. <laughs> Hey guys, it's Jessica taking a quick break from the podcast. What if one box could save two lives? Well, we've created something called the Love Box. It's an invitational gift that's placed in the hands of a single and pregnant woman that's just found out they're pregnant. These boxes are gifted to pregnancy centers across the nation as a tool to invite them inside of a church to an Embrace Grace support group. We are so excited to offer the opportunity for you to partner with us in this. To learn more about our love boxes on how they're distributed or how to partner with us on this, visit www.embracegrace.com. I definitely think like that it's out of sight, out of mind, right? So people just don't see the humanity of the unborn, but I think they're also used to being dehumanized by our side. So it's really important that we um, step back from, I know it's a very emotional life or death type conversation, but we step back and we just ask them because we might not know stuff about their story. You know, there's, um, there's a shirt that pro choicers wear that says somebody you love has had an abortion. And the crazy thing is that's absolutely true. Like we all probably know somebody who's had an abortion. And so when you're having this conversation from, you know, 6,000 feet above where you're talking about the politics and everything else, there's probably a very human story somewhere in there. And it's either a sister or an aunt or a mother or just a best friend who went through something like this. And I found when we talk to them about those stories, we can actually kind of start untying why it is they they feel they have to be pro-choice or support abortion access, right? Like yeah. a lot of times it's because a woman was in a vulnerable spot and she felt like she didn't have another choice. And yeah. there's a great um, there's a great quote from Frederica Matthews Green that says, no woman wants an abortion as she wants a Porsche or an ice cream cone. She wants an abortion as an animal with its leg caught in a trap wants to not self free. Wow. And that's what's happening. Like the pro-choice side thinks that they're helping her gnaw herself free. They think that that's actually like a helpful thing to do. And what we're saying is we don't want her to be named at all. We don't want any violence to enter the situation. We want to remove the trap from her altogether so that she can remain fully whole. And I think we have a lot more in common when we realize that both sides are trying to help. One side's just very misguided because they don't see the humanity of the unborn. Very good. That's really good. Okay, so I have been so inspired by all of the work that you're doing um, with at the border, helping women. And we saw a lot. Of, I know right now we're filming this at the end of summer, and it. I mean, just even the heat being down there, and you guys are doing the hard work. Um, helping bring resources and supplies um, to the border. Tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing. Yeah, so um, the last two years, we actually worked on the U.S. side of the border. And then this year, um, we got in contact with a woman who has been part of New Wave Feminist for a while. And she's like, I would love for you to come to Juarez and actually help us on this side. She runs a shelter for women who have been sexually assaulted and many of whom have become pregnant through it. And so um, just getting to go down there and love on these women and just see this incredible bond that they have with their, their children. Um, a couple of them have recently given birth. So we were just there this weekend and getting to just hold babies and love on these like amazing women. And it's so cool because I think a lot of times we hear that 
reason given for, you know, we need abortion because of cases of rape. And a lot of times here in the States, especially, it's like, well, that's only 1%. Um, but going to a place where that's quite a large percent and seeing these actual women, they're not just this talking point to win an argument on Facebook. Like these are real, you know, live women who have experienced this traumatic, horrific thing. And yet they're holding this child and loving this child. Um, it's been it's been such a neat thing, I think, as a feminist, especially to see this, because we're told all the time that, you know, that's that's the rapist baby. And that to me is one of the most patriarchal terms in in our whole vernacular. Um, it's not the rapist baby. It's that woman's baby. That woman has already had so much power that someone has attempted to steal from her. And the least we can do is give her that power back and acknowledge that this is her child. And so the fact that we had an opportunity to go just support these women um, with resources and our time. And um, I speak zero Spanish, by the way. I've been burning up my Duolingo trying to learn, and I'm such trash at it that I went to order a burrito. I swear I said Kukarni, you guys, but I got this, like, avocado with cheese. Like <laughs> You tortilla. live in Texas. You should at least know I Tex-Mex know, lingo. No, <laughs> we speak no, Tex-Mex. No excuse. I was I can at least order food there, right? Nothing. So it's funny because then we go to the shelter this weekend and all of the little kids always come up and play with my hair and they'll like put it on their head and act like they have purple hair. <laughs> and so I was using my translator and I was like, do you want me to dye your hair next time I come down? And they like start freaking out. They're like, yes, like Aww, make our hair purple next that'd time be you come so down. That's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm trying to translate real quick on like my translator app, um, like, you have to get your mom's permission. Go get your mom's permission. <laughs> <Montre>. <laughs> like, I'm going to dye all your hair purple next time we come back down. So they're just, they're the neatest, um, they're the neatest bunch of people. And they're going through the most horrific thing. You know, they've expa- escaped horrific violence uh, further down in South America. And now they're kind of just in this holding pattern, waiting for asylum into the U.S. And they really, they don't know if they're going to get it. Most of them don't. But in the meantime, we can make sure that they feel seen, that we realize that they count, that we make that like human connection with them. Because I think, especially when it comes to the issue of the border, it's another thing where we tend to make very political rather than just yeah. um, realizing this is a this is a people issue. These yeah, are people. These are our neighbors. It's a real. Person. This isn't about politics. This is about just loving people. Yeah, and when you see people who are have gone through something horrific, they're in such a vulnerable spot. Like. As pro-lifers, like, we need to be called down there. And I will say that was the reason that um, the volunteer who who followed New Way Feminist for so long reached out to us. She said, I look at y'all's marches, you know, and the the marches you have in the States, and so many people show up. And she's like, but when I have pregnant women being mistreated here at the border, like, there's nobody. Like, it's impossible for me to get people down here. And, (sighs) yeah, man, it's very (laughs) convicting. Like, because it's so political, we feel like we have to pick this side. But here's the deal, you don't. Like, just go love people well, like, especially people who are vulnerable, um, especially those of us here in Texas. Um, yeah. It's not that far. These are our neighbors. Yeah, yeah for sure. Are. So, okay, you just gave us some ideas of how people can make a difference at the border or even just in our world of just making people feel loved and seen. Are there any other thoughts that you have or even uh, tangible organizations, uh, New Wave Feminists for sure, um, but of what people can do even or even collecting supplies? What are the needs um, down there? Yeah, I would say um, definitely supplies. You know, things like maternity clothes, if you are done having kids and have some maternity clothes, um, that's a huge thing because our volunteer was telling us she went into the hospital right after mom had delivered and you know how here they give you at least a baby onesie and a little beanie for the baby but down there they don't give you anything like that especially if you can't afford uh like services and they they cannot refuse to see a pregnant woman so she comes in in full labor they have to go ahead and see her but they don't have to really supply anything else and so our volunteer walked in and she said this woman was just standing there completely naked because she had taken her gown off to wrap the baby so the baby would oh, be warm. My God. And she's like, I mean, she did not even have clothes. She had nothing. And when you don't have community, you don't have family, you know, people don't even know necessarily where you are to be able to help you. Like something as simple as our, you know, gently used maternity clothes goes a really long way. Um, baby clothes obviously goes a long way. We, we did a drive here in Dallas um, and just asked people, you know, if they had some stuff, we were taking the trip down to the border and we were able to fill up this enormous trailer with so many clothes. And so our volunteer said, it's crazy because 
um, like the more stuff you've brought, the more people know that I'm the lady with the stuff. And so I'm being able to help so many people, not even just women at her shelter, but all over Juarez, um, pregnant women and uh, women with small children are coming to her for help. And so there's definitely a great need down there. But I think there's also a lot of local need in our communities, which is why I love the fact that you're doing this podcast, because people tend to think, um, you know, if I'm pro-life and I want to volunteer, I need to work at a pregnancy center, which is great. You definitely do that. But I know for me, when I was a mom with young kids, I couldn't necessarily commit to two, three years every Tuesday and Thursday mm. of um, going in and doing something like that. And so I kind of thought, well, where where is a place for me in this movement? And I think we've got to get creative and look outside of the box as far as what are the needs in my community and what can I do to help a woman who's, who's in crisis? Um, a huge issue that finally is getting some national attention is the infant and maternal mortality rate among women of color. We know that they are dying during childbirth at a higher rate. And this is something that Planned Parenthood is really playing up as a fear factor to get them to choose abortion. And when we start looking at why that is, a lot of times it is because of um, lack of access to, to medical care or even just lack of being able to get to the appointment. So if you have a woman who's working an hourly job and maybe has kids, has to take a bus across town to get to a doctor's office, like all of these things can be deterrent. And so what they see is a lot of women um, will go in for the, the one anatomy scan to kind of like find out the sex and make sure everything's okay and then they won't necessarily go back until the day that they go into labor and a lot of times that means they don't have a relationship with their doctor so yeah. if something feels weird about their body during birth they they can tell the doctor but if the doctor doesn't know them right. then maybe it's not being taken seriously and we see women hemorrhaging to death and everything else um and so when it comes to the infant maternal mortality rate uh, among women of color, there have been studies done where it's not even an education or socioeconomic issue. Like there is obviously some sort of racial bias that's happening in um, kind of the medical community that has to be addressed. But we also know that that uh, socioeconomical income issues do play a part in that. Uh, and not even just among black women, but any woman who would be struggling with making it to a doctor's appointment. So something as simple as creating a network of four or five women in your town and saying, okay, if any, if we run into anybody who needs a ride to the doctor's office, so they don't have to wait on a bus to go across town and take off all these hours from work. Like that is a huge way we can help just getting women to doctor's appointments to make sure that their baby is healthy and happy and growing and that they're, you know, having access to medicines and nutritious foods or things like that. Just like find somebody and love them really well. You know, yeah. I think a lot of times we think like being pro-life is, talking about our beliefs and trying to conform society to us and voting a certain way and getting laws passed like no sometimes it's literally just loving the people closest to you really well and figuring out what's going on um and there's so many of those opportunities if you start looking for them in in any community big cities rural cities like it's all the same there's so many ways we can love people better that is so wow. good that you gave us tons of ideas that's awesome well how can people connect to your organization Okay, so first there has to be a disclaimer, obviously, before okay. they connect to our organization. <laughs> um, Facebook and Instagram, but Ugh. if you're like a little sensitive <laughs> to language or things, maybe don't. Um, she's a little crass and she cusses a little, but she she's amazing. <laughs> amazing. It's something where it's like, you might not be into it, but your grandkids will be. And it's funny because I used to say that all the time that like, I would have people who were like totally scandalized by me, but it's like, but can you talk to my granddaughter with a mohawk? And I'm like, heck yeah. <laughs> and at one point I got a call from a friend. It was Tulsi Gabbard's parents. And they were like, you should, yeah, we need to get you to talk to our daughter. And I'm like, whoa, like she's running for president. My, my theory has worked that if I get in with like the older generation, They'll eventually have me talk to their young kids. It's going to work. Uh, it's with working. my potty mouth. We'll see. Maybe. I love that you are just <laughs> authentically you, Destiny. Yes, that's why we love you. Okay, but, okay, you said you're in your social media pages. What's your web website? Newwavefeministplural.com. And awesome. then from there, you can find all of our other social media. Okay, yay. Thank you, Destiny, so much. You're amazing. We are pumped and inspired and want to totally help with what you're doing. And we hope I'm excited that about this will. book and yes. this podcast. Thank you so much for having me on. Yes, thanks, yes. Destiny. See you later. Well, I am so excited about what she's doing. Like, 
Every time I hear her speak about what she's doing, I feel like I'm not doing enough. I know, right? She is, she's just so inspiring and she's not afraid to get sweaty, dirty, have, you know, I'm sure where she's going isn't the most safe area to go to, but she's there and she's loving on those women and making a difference. And, um, but those stories just really tugged at my heart and Mm -hmm. it's just awesome. And I've seen the big trailer that she had filled up. I think she was starting with like a small one, but more and more and more people it was huge got involved and they, I mean, it was a giant U-Haul that they sent over there with so much supplies. And I love how she just really brings in the community, other organizations. She really activates people to get involved across belief systems, across, you know, whether they're Christian or not a faith or an atheist or Democrat or Republican. Like, she doesn't care what you are or how you identify yourself. Just let me love you and let's do this together. And that's inspiring. Right. And that's a really creative way of how you can help women be brave is, um, is I feel like it was twofold. One was, um, going to the marches and having a voice, whether it's the pro-life March or the women's March, but then also being the hands and feet of Jesus as we serve and love on these women. So there were great ideas. And like she said, uh, outside of the bounds of, of pregnancy centers, which are so important too. Um, but then there's always embrace grace as well, that there's, um, you can get plugged in and lead a group and love on women, Um, in that way. And I love with Embrace Grace that it involves the church. Like it's not cookie cutter how we help women be brave. Like there's not like A plus B equals C and then a baby is saved. (laughs) Like I wish it's every. We go through the whole alphabet. Right. Yes. It's very complex. Every woman's situation. So how we can be Holy Spirit led in the way we love on each mom makes a huge difference. And um, like I met one at a restaurant the other day that was pregnant, only 17 and I got to um, just, I just asked, I kept texting her. She kind of was shy at first and she finally started opening up and I was like, do you need something? And she said, I just need someone to talk to besides my parents. I'm like, girl, yeah. I got you. <laughs> so we Let's went to this. lunch and we connected and she's bringing her mom to the office, um, I think this week. And she was a blessing to me. She was amazing. And so there's people like that everywhere. Yeah. You can just be on watch and looking for um, the people that need hope and healing. So we hope that you were inspired by this um, show today. Give us feedback. If you get connected with New Way Feminists or any of the organizations that we highlight on the show, let us know. Uh, We would love to hear the stories of how you're helping women be brave. Thanks so much for tuning in.